Clinton, we'll, yeah. we'll go back yeah. and um, <clears throat> start by asking you where your rugby league journey began. And can you tell us uh, where you grew up and who your junior club was? Yeah, no worries. Um, look, I grew up in um, a, a little town called Pamir, and I I actually, my very first club was called the GI Falcons. Um, and that was back in 1985, 86, and 87 from memory. And um, they ended up folding. So I went and played with the Richmond Rovers for a couple of years. So my dad took me over there. Dad was coach, and then he coached me over at Richmond Rovers. And I think when I was around 1990, um, we were playing the, the Mount Wellington Warriors. And oh, for some reason, the coach said, Oh, it must have found out that um, I lived in the area, but I was driving over to Grey Lynn um, for trainings. And he, and he just said, do you want to come play for us? We'd, we'd be keen to have you. And then, you know, Peter Peter um, Bredenbeck was the reason why I ended up going in the direction I went to because he was, he was just one of those coaches that went that extra mile for the team and the players. So I, I was there till 1995-96. And then that's when him and his son, Kurt Bredenbeck, and he was one of those players that, New professionalism to me. I I just thought I just rock up and play, you know, a bit of backyard footy and fun and things like that. But um, they made the decision to go to Odahu Leopards because they felt that there was going to be more opportunities there, and so they did the leap, and then I followed on behind, and then you know that's when it started to sort of really take off from there. Uh, Bernie um, Henry's father came over and coached us at the Colts there. I really think that system worked really well back when we were playing because it was the under 23s at the time. We ended up winning it with Odahu Leopards under Bernie Perinara with, I think, um, mm. Henry Curtin and a couple of other players. Um, I thought that was a good transition into playing with men because the 23 year olds were still, you know, they were just young men. Yeah. And we were sort of babies playing amongst them, but it just conditioned our body a little bit better to transition. Um, sorry, a little call coming in here. Um, no yeah, transitioning into, uh, I guess, the local um, A grade comp there with the Odahu Leopards. And yeah, then things started sort of coming along from there. Yeah, well. And Odahu yeah. Leopards was where it sort of I launched from that platform with the obviously got a rich history of um, rugby league. Some great players, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, in 99, you made your first great career for the then Auckland Warriors in the round nine loss to South Sydney. Um, what do you remember about your debut and, and how did you go, How did the call-up come about to play? Yeah, look, I think at the time, the, I, the year before, um, Henry Perinara, Henry Fa'afili, Harry Aonga and myself got signed on a scholarship at the end of 1998, and you know we we were pretty excited, but you know, we didn't really know the, the the significance of it, other than it sounded good and it was a connection into you know where we wanted to get to. And um, you know within a year, got the tap on the shoulder from Mark Graham. Mark Graham came watched me, and I, I've always been a back rower. I was I'd never played centre in my life. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Even into, like, I learned at the top grade how to play centre. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Mark Graham tapped me on the shoulder when I was over at the Odahu Leopards uh, playing for the seniors there under uh, James Lulawai, who was the reasons why I changed to centre. Uh, but I debuted as a back rower. I think I was 80-something kilos ringing wet. And, um, yeah, I, I still have fond memories of it. I know we went down, but it was it was like one of those dreams that you, those childhood dreams that you, you sort of have growing up wanting to play for your, you know, your local team or, or yep. an NRL team. And, um, you know, I always tell the kids whenever I'm going out and delivering sessions that I was quite a visual person. So I, I'd had like pictures, like what you've got on the back of your wall there, Hammer. Yeah, bro. Uh, yeah. And Rue, um, yeah. on my walls. And I used to come home Sometimes drunk, sometimes yeah. 
you know, <laughs> after going training and used to sit there and visualise myself playing alongside those guys. And um, I'd said, you know, to the young ones, if that's ever something that works for them, then, you know, you should give it a crack because it's a way of setting goals. It's a visual way of reading your goals, you know, out in front of you and so you're constantly in and on them. But, um, yeah, it, before you know it, I was... I was playing with the guys I had on my wall, like yeah. Matthew Ridge, Logan Swan, who all took me under their belts, those two in particular, mm. and, um, you know, looked after me really well. Yeah, great. The visual is a great way to look at it, yeah. Um, you only played two games in 1999, and then the 2000 season, you ended up playing um, the final four rounds of the season. You actually played fullback. Um, and that season, you scored your first try for the club in a 44-12 to 12 win over the Cowboys. Do you remember your first try in first grade? No, I actually don't, but there's a funny story behind me going into fullback. Okay. So, um, Mark Graham is, you know, like, I'm starting to train with the full-time squad now post that um, debut. And... Um, you know, Mark Graham is putting all the resis, all the reserve players and all the youngsters out in positions, and he didn't have a position for me. So he said to me, oh, um, we'll chuck you at fullback. And then he chuckled to himself and said, but oh, that'll never happen. And um, lo and behold, Matthew Ridge ends up injuring his um, Achilles inside our gym where we play kick tennis. Mm. And kick tennis was a bit of a fun way that we used to play. This big, it was like a big tennis slash soccer ball. Yep. We set up a little mini um, tennis court inside the gym, as you do. There's professional rugby players, you know. Yep. Uh, you set up a <laughs> kick tennis inside your gym, but he ended up he ended up injuring himself, and because I did so well against A grade or the seniors at the time playing fullback. They, they threw me in there, even though it was a last-minute thing and it was more of a just full of holes because I'd never played there in my life. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, you know, young whippet, keen as mustard to try and do whatever I can to just play footy. And so, yeah, no, I don't actually remember the try that I scored, but it must have been, you know, a good win if it's, um, you know, we've put 44 points on. Yeah, I was a yeah. field special, I think, yeah. Rob can remember every <laughs> try scored by every player. He's got this photographic memory of everything. visual, visual memory. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm just amazed. It's um, it, just hearing that you're a second uh, back rower. You must have been the fastest back rower ever. I have because, to have because <laughs> you're a fast centre. Like you used to put centres to to the test, bro. It's, um, yeah, I, I suppose. Um, yeah, that that um, being mentored under. James Lulawa, who's a Kiwi legend that yep. is a you know a household name to everybody who played in the centres. And I sort of had the same physique as him, but I was in the back row. But he he, he felt that it was a, a, it's where he felt I best suited at the time when I was over playing at the Odahu Leopards, which then sort of launched me into playing centre for the rest of my, 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 my footy career. Yeah. Um, but where that speed came from, I don't know. Maybe it was when mum's trying to give me a hiding or trying to... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, at the end of that 2000 season, the Auckland Warriors were under pretty immense financial pressure. Eric Watson purchased the key assets of the club, but that didn't include the player contracts. And many players were released and had to fight to get their money. What do you remember about that whole situation? Or was that something that you don't remember too much because you were just so young coming through? Yeah, look, I, like we saw it and I, I was pretty naive um, at that age and not really, I was just, you know, not really. I was just more um, just happy that I was in somewhere where I dreamt of being and like that kind of stuff. It didn't even phase me, but... I had a, another mentor and a guy who was my manager from the age of 16 up until this day. And um, I know he's not managing me now, but Peter Brown was, uh, you know, really like a father figure to me. And, yep. um, you know, he looked after my family when I'd travel away, got us into our first house, all these little things that, um, 
they allowed me to focus on my footy and, um, you know, that sort of stuff he took care of. So I, I don't recall much of that at all. I, I only, you know, bits and pieces, but it obviously didn't affect me financially <laughs> because I probably would remember if it did, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, only, only 10 players from the 2000 roster were actually retained and thankfully you were one of them. Um, the club was then rebranded into the, the New Zealand Warriors, complete with the change of colour uh, and um, from the white to the black. And um, new coach Daniel Anderson took the reins. Um, as a, as a six-game rookie in first grade yourself, how did you feel about the new direction that the club was going in at that time? Uh, look, from the, from the, from the outset, um, Daniel won me over. Um, just... Just the way he went about his business, he, um, in my eyes, is probably the best coach I've ever had. Probably the best coach I've ever had, mm. and and in all my time, I've you know sort of been in and around the, the footy scene, and um, I've actually still got contact with him. Actually, um, I met up with him about a week ago, and he did a because he's obviously the um, well, not obviously he's the head of recruitment for the Roosters, mm. and so. Um, yeah, they put on a couple of clinics over here on the on the Gold Coast or out in Logan there and yep. sort of, you know, cross paths with them. But straight away again, um, the things that he did with us way back then to, you know, still doing what he's doing now and implementing that with the youngsters. And what I mean by that, and I always use the same old boring story, but um, when we used to uh, play our style of footy, He'd never want to coach us out of it. He'd always want to sharpen and make us make sound decisions, even though I was a bit of a loose cannon and I hardly listened anyway. But um, just the small thing in the sense of the way we carried the ball. I don't know what to show you, but basically we used to, I, I used to hold the ball like that. So the ball in there, hold it in there, you know, running around like that, just a normal kind of grip, even though my hands are barely... You know, you know, enough to grip the ball, but that's the way I just as a youngster carried it. And he sort of said to us, you know, get the grips in the middle of the ball, hold the ball like that. I, I, I still want you to carry it with one if you're going to carry it in the one hand, but have it out so you can grip it and bring it into your body. Because when you go to offload, you don't have much control over it. Yeah. And when people come in to snap it down, there's no real grip on it. And so just little things like that, like just sharpening what was already in place, if that makes sense, rather than mm. you're not doing that. That's a low risk, uh, on a high risk. And um, he just really emphasized that like, that's your natural game. And I'm not ever going to push it out of you. And I, and I love that about him. And he played a lot of competitive games, which we were all competitors. We all would, you know, didn't even want to stop training because, you know, the games were that had that kind of, I guess, competitiveness about it. And it was all game simulation. I think he was ahead of his time with a lot of the stuff that, you know, you know, really doing a lot in the game today. That um, that style of play was pretty synonymous with the Warriors back in those days too, wasn't it? And it was great that he encouraged that mm. Cavalier kind of play. It's, um, Didn't try and coach it out of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you played your first game of the twenty of the two thousand and one season in round four against the Dragons, and then from there became a regular in the team, playing every remaining game that season uh, in first grade, leading up to the semi-finals and scoring eleven tries. What do you remember most about that two thousand and one season, that that breakout season where you really cemented a spot in the first grade squad? Uh, look, I think for me it was um, you know believing in myself and setting goals to become a regular, I think, because I've been sort of in and around the system, you know, for, you know, the last couple of years, I really wanted to make myself a, just a regular. It was just a goal of mine. And so I put those things in place. And then eventually it, um, yeah, sort of hit the ground running in 2001. I think I started enjoying, you know, what we were trying to build on uh, with Daniel Anderson over the preseason and then, Everyone just came really close knit and tired, and I think that belief within the team, and you know, we had a few, you know, good leaders that were, um, you know, directing us around the park, and 
um, you know, Stacy, Monty, Logan, um, uh, Arwen, all those guys, Joe Bugner at the time, all those guys were really, um, you know, strong in the sense of their, their belief and the, the core leadership group that allowed us to come in and feel welcome. But, you know, at times I'd probably be making them pull their hair out of their heads, but allowed us to play the way we play, you know. Um, like you got Henry Clark Philly, uh, Warangi Kōpū, all these boys that came through all at the same time, Shante and Hapi. It was, um, it was a time to remember, and I, I just loved every minute of it. I think we, we got so, I guess, we believed in each other so much that when we were down in a lot of the games, we, we just had this, I, I don't know if it's arrogance or, or just that self-belief in each other that we weren't going to lose or we'd come back from it. You know, we just had that mentality about us. And I think, you know, those con games that Daniel used to do for us and uh, I think the makeup of the team we had with Harley and all those guys, um, yeah, just brought that sense of, I guess, pride and belief in, 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 in the team. One of the most amazing games of that 2001 season was a game against the Bulldogs in Wellington uh, where we came back from a 16-point deficit in the final three minutes and you actually scored a try, a runaway try, um, set up by Justin Morgan. Uh, the, <laughs> you scored a try next to the posts um, to make it 24-all. Unfortunately, Stacey missed the, missed the kick. Uh, next to the post, yeah. But you must remember that. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I, I actually saw it on the post um, when they were doing that stuff with the, the Warriors boys this year. I think they had a bit of, you know, I think it was trivia. And um, yeah, I thought it was yes. yeah, it was quite fun and and, and funny. They were like, oh, did, did Morgs bust a knee? Did he do this and that? Yeah. But you know, he put me away for a try assist, and um, I was trying my best to get as close as I could. But um, I think it was our Masri or somebody was just hunting me on the inside, and I, I didn't want to sort of try and force the issue and do the bloopers real uh, <laughs> and, and and not get the try. So I. Try to get it. and like nine times out of ten, Stacy nails those. You know, Stacy, Stacy, exactly. Yeah. It's not yep. the gen, it's not called the general for nothing. One of the greatest players I've ever had to play with um, in all my time. Um, selfless players as well, but yeah, no, it's we. It was that kind of fight back that we had in the club, and um, you know, you've seen glimpses of it this year with that that the boys, even though they're so mm. far away from home and and all our supporters and fans. I know we've got a heap of them over here too, but there's nothing like, you know, the, the base of uh, Mount, Mount Smart Stadium and, and the, yeah. the love they have there. Yeah. Well, most well, most experts had us tipped for the wooden spoon in 2001, um, but we surprised everyone and we actually finished eighth. The first time that Warriors had ever qualified for the finals. So that was a very big occasion. Although, unfortunately, we were convincingly beaten 56 to 12 in that qualifying final by Parramatta. Um, aside, aside from the result in that game, it must have felt really good to play in your first NRL finals game. Yeah, look, and for, for me, I, I didn't realise the significance of it all until years after my footy. I, hmm. Yes, you want to play semi-finals footy, but I've, I've had this talk a lot of times with, you know, family, friends, and, you know, even, you know, Warriors supporters. And we never knew what semifinals footy was. We never knew what it was like to play in the grand final. We, we were the pioneers um, in that space. You know, you look at the, the clubs like Parramatta and the Roosters, all those NRL clubs, they've got decades, they've got hundreds of years of experience mm. at that level and they've got players, I, I even said like, we've only got one player in our club that's ever played, what, 300 I think some have come close to it Yeah, but that's 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 pioneering for our club and um, I think me being so naive and you know, probably you know, probably with, with my head up my ass back in those days, I think I um I never really valued how important those sorts of things was, you know, like I even regret now 
to this day not taking the fullness of that grand grand final that we're playing. I still it still hurts a little bit, even though it's like, like mm. <laughs> 20 years ago. Mm. I still regret not having the right mindset in in that particular moment that we played. Even that the year before, you talk about the semis. Now we made the grand finals. All those things you don't realise the significance of it until you know you're past your footy. And it's weird that you would think that because everybody likes playing 40, our semi-finals 40, they all play to win the comp. And for us, it was just new to be a professional rugby league player. It was new to play for your own NRL club in your own country. It was new to actually play in semi-finals 40. All those things were, we were the pioneers of that space. Mm -hmm. I just wish, you know, could have, like, if we could turn back time that we had those foundations already in place. But I think, We've got a good opportunity with, you know, some of the things we've built over the years, uh, whether that's our era or the, you know, um, Sean Johnson and then all those boys' eras. I think we can, I reckon we've got a great opportunity. I haven't been back home for a while for any of those warrior things, and I probably regret that, but, you know, it's a, I think they really need to really um, do a big emphasis on the history and those players being involved, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That um, 21, 2001 season, um, your form's so good, you're picked to represent the Kiwis in June and play your first test against France. Can you tell us um, the emotions around uh, earning your first Kiwi test jersey and the experience representing your country? Yeah, yeah, man. It... Um, I, I got told secondhand, I think it was through somebody else, and I didn't even realise, but um, as I go back to my um, my visual or my goals, I had the Warriors on my wall, and I'd been given this small um, Kiwis picture um, of, I think it was the, I think it was maybe the 98, 99 Kiwis. And I had that right at the top of my wall. <laughs> and it was it was crazy how it sort of panned out that, you know, I visualised playing with the Warriors and then, you know, within a year or two later, I was, you know, representing my country. And it was um, it was one of the, oh, the greatest achievements of my time. Um, I know, um, probably speak for many of the other boys as well, it's just... You know, it's that cliche, it's a dream come true, because it is. It's like, um, I don't know, I haven't won the lotto, but I suppose it's like winning the lotto or when you when you have your first child, it's it's one of those amazing things that can, you know, never be replaced. Yep. Yeah, well, you touched on 2002 a bit before, but obviously it's it was the biggest season for the Warriors to date. Um in 2002, you continued your good form from 2001 and you were an integral member of the squad that went on to win the minor premiership um, and the first and only in the club's history. Um, and you scored 18 tries that season. So what are your memories of the, the wonderful 2002 season as a whole? Um, yeah, oh, I'll, go, I'll go back to, um, you know, the club, being at ease with, you know, good leadership at the top and it felt like um, we were one big family and I and I, I truly believe that, like, as much as Eric Watson was a multi-millionaire, he was a very humble, loving, caring person um, in those moments, whether that was in the sheds or when we were getting invited over to his house or just, um, it just felt like um, we were his... As, 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 as kids, you know, and treated us like that. And um, Eric Eric was, you know, just a, I guess, like a mentor for the whole club. Um, I know people probably don't speak too highly of him with things that have gone on in the past, but in our time, it was, um, you know, good memories. It was um, amazing times. And, you know, uh, that was no different with Mick Watson and um, Daniel Anderson. I think they they were new to success. We were all new to success. And I think we were just riding the train of um, believing in ourselves, having uh, that matter of faith song that uh, I think Lappi, I think it was Lappi Marin, 
that sang that song. Oh, forgive me, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think, so, yeah. I think it, it, it actually was. We based our 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 a lot of our stuff on on you know faith in each other, and you know we had a few religious boys and Ali, Jerry, Motu, uh, who were you know um, faith driven men who you know put God first, but it sort of influenced. Uh, I know a lot of our boys in the team at the time, and I think it was culturally we were sort of in tune. Um, we had a lot of characters. I was probably the clown of the lot, but um, you know we had a whole bunch of great guys with a mix of um, Australian boys: Campion, and Ivan, um, what do we got? EJ Marsh, and you know all these guys that were um, you know just just slotted in and felt like they're at home and I know every time uh, an overseas player whether they're Australian um, or, or anything else they just get to embrace the amazing culture that we have as Kiwis I think it's kind of unique and special and I think that's something that we will always have over other clubs is that, that special bond we got there. I just think we've got to try and turn that bond and mm-hmm. bring it into consistency. I know people are probably going, oh, you weren't consistent. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's one of those things. I, I literally played like how I would play in the backyards of my uncles, you know, yeah. growing up, mm-hmm. getting bashed by my uncles. We'd either play walking head ups or on our knees head ups. And they, they, they probably don't realise it, but they were conditioning me. But that was the fun stuff. We'd throw the ball out of our asses, and we'll be getting, you know, showing how to really smash and tackle like all those little snippets and those little nuggets over my time. They all contributed to, or it all contributes to all of our youngsters that play with that flair and that kind of ad lib style. You know, it's that, it's that stuff that we shouldn't ever coach out or ever stop our kids from doing. When, yeah. when we're in the backyard and you're seeing them throwing around don't turn us into robots let us play free will because sometimes and when you're in a pickle those are the moments that allows us to get out of shit <laughs> it, it's interesting you talk about the cultural side of things too so I've, uh, this season in particular the Warriors have really embraced that um, I don't know if you've seen any of the, the footage where they uh, Cameron George released through his um on the road with the Vodafone Warriors where they've had cultural nights. Um, so, you know, they had the Tongan boys put on a performance. They had the Fijian boys, the Samoans, um, the Indigenous boys and the Maori boys. Um, and it's kind of, when you talk to the players, they talk about how much it's united them and, and really brought them together. And it was something that the Warriors women's side from last season um, bought into and uh, introduced. And the, the, the men's side has really continued on with that this this season it does make a difference it makes a massive difference well when you you think about the makeup of new zealand and you know you know from the maori side to the multicultural sort of connections we really embrace cultures and culture um and 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 the spiritual connections we have with those cultures i think um you know, we don't have to be like the other NRL clubs. We don't have to not embrace those things because, you know, we're, we're a spiritual country. We're a spiritual um, a, a, a people. And I don't think that it should ever be taken out of any organisation that's based in New Zealand, you know. Even if we play in an Australian comp, I think we really need to embrace a lot of that stuff and, um, I think what we need to also remember too is not to go too mouldy. Yes, <laughs> yes, we are mouldy, and that's um, indigenous to our country. But you know, you look at our team. You know, we're like you said, we're Fijian, we got Tongans, we got Indigenous, we got Australians, we've got um, anglo saxon New Zealand. You know? yep. And so, I think we need to not make things too much of one particular culture, even though that might be the indigenous to the country itself. I think we need to have that happy medium or that balance. And I think, you know, from all accounts that that's something they've embraced and the woman led the way last year. And I've heard a lot of great things about what they were able to achieve um, in the camp. Yep. Um, That 2002 
uh, season. We played the Canberra Raiders in that qualifying semi-final, and it's the first semi-final we ever played back home at Mount Smart Stadium. And we win that game 36-20. What do you remember about that semi-final at home? I just remember all the supporters, you know, coming out and, like, it just you, – you felt the energy and the love of um, – we had put a bit of pride back in our jersey um, and in and, and rugby league. You know, for so long, we were always in the shadows of rugby union and the All Blacks. And, you know, we brought a bit of pride back to our, you know, to our to our game and to all the people that have always had that faith in, in rugby league. And, you know, the Warriors were able to put that on the, on the, on the big stage and, um, yeah, it was just a, a lovely feeling and, and um, a touching moment for the for the club, but also as as as, as a team to bring our semi-finals home and have uh, have such a great turnout. I think I, I, I'm only assuming it was it was in the, um, over 24, 25,000 people or something. Yeah, it was comfortably a sellout. Yeah, yeah, massive crowd. And, um, yeah, like people, when you're out there, you, you know, that can influence you when you are playing, you know, whether that's the good stuff or the bad stuff, you know. But I know that the Warriors, they turn up and whether it's raining, it's hailing, um, they're always there. The core ones are always there in full force supporting them. Um, you try to, you know, do it for yourself and your families, but also those supporters that have just got your back. And I've never got to realise how much it meant until being on the other side of it because you get caught up in just being a player and this and that and not really appreciating how much it means to community. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there truly is a really loyal core uh, base of fans back there in NZ and we're lucky enough to have met a lot of them. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the following week after that game, we got the week off, which led us to the biggest game in the club's history at that point, which was the uh, the grand final qualifier against the Sharks, where we, we won a very tough game, 16 to 10, to advance to the very first grand final in the club's history. But you yourself scored a fantastic try in that game, uh, running down the sideline, taking on David Peachy and um, scoring in the corner there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh... Yeah, what do you remember about about that game, and also what it was like to return home to New Zealand after that? Yeah, look, it um, it was a bit of a blue. I think we got off to a, a, a pretty good start. I think was that where Motu got the intercept yes, at the did, start yeah. there. Yeah, and it just sort of, I think it broke the nerves a little bit. I think we um, sort of, yeah, you know, like I said, we were breaking new ground on on a lot of things, and you know to dig that deep into the semifinals. It was, um, yeah, just a, a, a good way to get the, what do you, what's the, the cobwebs or whatever I'm trying to find the words to say about, you know, getting that you off Get the back. monkey off your back. The yeah. monkey off your back, yeah. yeah. And it allowed us to sort of get on with the game. And yeah, like you said, it was a, a hard fought match, but um, yeah, I, I remember that try too. It's, yeah. It was, um, I don't know, for some reason, I, I should have stepped back inside. But because Peachy was coming across, he was looking me in the eye and he still had this sort of arrogance about him. <laughs> and in that split second that he was looking at me, it, it was almost like, yeah. He had that look like, I got you. Really, you there's no way for you to go. And I just went, oh, fuck you, then let's go. I'll try him <laughs> down the sideline. And that's when I tried to take him on the side, on the outside. I wouldn't have normally done. I would have tried to beat him on the inside, but because I had, he had this sort of look like, "Yeah, I got you covered, buddy," which he probably would have. But I, for some reason, I went down the least likely of taken place to run. You know, yep. and it paid off. Thankfully, otherwise, Daniel would have been trying to rip my head off <laughs> and the rest of the boys. <laughs> that was um, that was the game too. That uh, before that game, Eric Watson bought ten thousand tickets. And then um, I know we had to produce our New Zealand passports. And if you produced your New Zealand passport, you got four tickets to the game. So it was great because I, I know we had a, a good crowd of about 10,000 people at that game. <laughs> yeah. 10,000 Warriors fans at that game. I'm just reading a couple of comments that are coming through. 
in particular. Uh, Charlie Russ has said, um, when you scored that, that try, was that a double movement? <laughs> um, uh, it was momentum, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> momentum. And I, I said it at the time. <laughs> yeah, momentum. And um, so, what up, Charlie? We, we used to actually go to high school together and I didn't realise he was that much of a um, avid supporter of the Warriors. Um, I think he's oh, just got no. some mannequins that was bigger than his garage turn up yeah. to his house. He so. has the best collection of jerseys in oh. the world of Warriors jerseys and wow. merchandise. He's I'll the man. What, he stitches us up with some questions at times too, doesn't he? Oh, ask him this. <laughs> ask him this. Yeah, ask him, yeah. <laughs> and um, TK Harris is saying, hello, Clinton, how are you, bro? Um yeah, it's just uh, that's, yeah. That's why I'm looking away quite a bit because I'm just reading comments that are coming coming through. I just want to make sure that you know some of these guys that that know you and remember you from back in the day at the club. Um, uh, yeah, what up, TK? Um, yeah, um, we've had both Mark Tukey and Justin Murphy on this show talking about that grand final week, um, the lead up to the game. And we've also spoken to both Jimmy Maloney and Michael Lark about the lead up to the 2011 grand final. And they've all said it can be a real blur and just such a crazy, crazy week. Uh, and I know you spoke about, you know, not, um, you know, realizing the importance of it at, at the time when you were playing uh, at that time. But what do, you, what do you remember about the lead up to the game, especially going back to New Zealand, then you had to come back early for that grand final breakfast. Um you know, you guys training while Billy Idol's singing his um, <laughs> songs that no one ever got to hear on grand final day. <laughs> yeah, look, it, it was a bit of a blur. And um, I think the things, the best way that I sum it up, and, and forgive me to all those ones that have heard me say it a few times uh, before, but at the time, like, we had made a goal to make the grand final. That was our goal. Yep. And um, and it's hard to fathom, you know, if you're hearing me say it and you're on the other side because you're like, man, you want to win grand finals. But for us, it was almost like we achieved what we set out to achieve and it yep. felt like mm -hmm. I got caught up in the, we did it, we're here, how awesome. And then before you know it, the game was over. Yeah. And I felt like I got caught up in the occasion of just the, the enormity of it. Um, mm. And the, I guess the, yeah, just the, the bright lights, and the, the 80,000 people, the supporters. And I probably didn't play my best footy that day either because, like I said, I, I never really... Yeah, never knew what to experience or, or expect. I, it, there was only one person in that whole team. I think it was um, Kevin Campion who'd ever played in a grand final before. Yeah. Every, everybody else, we might have played them when we were juniors, but not at the highest level of, um, you know, rugby league. Mm. And um, I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody else. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And when I look back, those are the things that I feel... Um, you know, if I was able to do it again, I'd be, you know, head down, bum up, focused on on the game ahead as opposed to, man, I'm so happy that we're here. I'm just enjoying this, how good. And then before you know it, you know, that was gone and was never able to replicate it again. Um, you know, obviously with the, 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 the new squad in 2011 and we've come close, you know, many other times, but, um, you know, would have loved to have built a, a dynasty with those boys that we had and it was sad that we had to see the likes of Ivan Cleary, then Kevin Campion, then um, you know, sort of Ali, Logan, Francis, like just ripped away from us. Uh, you know, when you think that and it's sad to get back to it. And I've I've asked a couple of people that were high up at the time and they said I said, why didn't we keep any of those players? Why didn't we keep blah, 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 blah? And they, were, they basically went on to say that um, the success was new for us. And we only knew that way. When we, we, 
when when we had a bit of a lull, everyone thought we were past it. <laughs> and we were like 23, 24. Mm. You know, they never knew that maybe we go up and then we have a little bit of a dip and then we can go again. Uh, but like I said, we were pioneering a lot of that stuff. We were we were setting the foundations of things that wasn't even there to start with. So yep. we yeah. were just running with it. And then people started thinking, oh, they, they're ungrateful or they're not up to it anymore. Bring some youth through. Hey, we'd only been two years in first grade. <laughs> You're young until, you know, I just, it was just sad that that had to happen the way it did. And it was a fast rise and, and a fast fall. You know, and I think we never really recovered um, until, you know, a few years later, which is sad. I know 2003, we, we came close again. Yep. Um, Just you know, beaten by Penrith the week before. Mm. Yeah, that one was um, that one was a tough one. I think the week before we had Canberra and it came down to Naywara and um, Stacey nailed it, nailed a field goal to get us the win, but that was probably the most physical um, game I'd ever played in. Um, and I think we contemplated at the time to stay in Sydney, yep. but because I think we had some young families and stuff like that, we decided to do the right thing by the families. But yeah, hindsight, if we were to do it again, we probably should have stayed. Yep. Should have, could have, would have, but I think our bodies were so bashed up that we get on a plane the next day, fly home, you know, a couple of days later, you know, get get overawed by, like, you know, what we just achieved then to get on the plane a couple of days later, regroup. But, you know, it was just, I think, a bit too much. And then by the time we got to Penrith, we were sort of a bit fatigued. Yeah. And um, there was moments where we probably should have won that and could have won that but I think that um, that fatigue and everything else had sort of taken its toll but I think now they've, um, you know science is well and truly embedded in, in our in our game and it was just starting out when I was coming in yep. and on my way out it was just slowly coming in like we used to have you know one of the ex-players who didn't have any degree or anything but Knew how to flog, yeah. <laughs> but um, there, yeah, but um, I think that's that sort of day and age is well and truly gone now. Science is in, and I think they would take into consideration all that sort of stuff now. Well, you'd like to think so, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Just, just um, going back to the two thousand and two grand final, um, we had Mark Tuki on last year. And he told us that um, he was actually a Wairangi Corpu elbow that opened up Freddie Fittler in the head in the grand final and not Richard Villasanti's tackle, which we'd all thought over the past 19 years. What are your, what are your memories of that Shit. particular momentum changing incident in the grand final? Yeah, I, I don't even, I can't even recall. I, I thought it was Villa the Gorillas as big melon that uh -huh. went into it because I think he follows through with his head yeah, after he, he goes on the ground. So mm. you assume that it was, you know, either pre that or during that kind of <laughs> hungi, hungi. It's kind of <laughs> hungi. Yeah. yeah, so I, I, I didn't even realise that it was Wairangi, the bro Wairangi. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, when Tuk told us, we were amazed. We, we didn't know why. mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's... And, um, uh, I'm filthy on us that we didn't like flog, um, you know, Morley when he threw out of the line, and you know, I just mm. because I I truly believe that the majority of us were just overawed by the the occasion. Mate, and if for we, sixty minutes, for sixty minutes we were in it. You know, Stacey scores the the best solo try ever in a grand final. And, oh my goodness! Mm. I know yeah. that was. It's still in, in the memory bank, that one. Yeah. Yeah, for all of us. But it, oh, it's weird. It just felt like, yeah, once they got one or two tries back to back, it felt like it was like on a you know, slippery slope and we we're sort of yeah. trying to fight our way back out, but we weren't really, yeah, we didn't really get it. And so, yeah, that's 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 one that's still 
is still pretty raw, even though it's sort of 19, 20 years later. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, that 2002 season, you you really established yourself as one of the top centres in the game. You're rewarded again with a call up to the Kiwi squad that played a test in Wellington against the Kangaroos and then went and played two tests in England against Great Britain. How was your first touring experience over in England with the Kiwis? Oh, yeah. You know, I wasn't the best. I'm, I'm glad they don't have social media now because oh my <laughs> God, I probably yeah, would have got in big trouble. Yeah. I was a bit of a loose cannon, but I'm glad that I had those good guys that were around me that were sort of looking after me. They took me under their wing and and really sort of kept me on the, the straight and narrow, as they say. But um, guys like Warangi and Logan, they, they were really, really, um, they really had my back. And um, I still value their friendship. I probably don't talk to them, to them as much as um, I should. But, you know, those were the guys that sort of, I you know, loved them for what they did and looked after me. But, no, that tour, that tour was just amazing. Like, we're, we're like little kids, you know, going around where, like loud and laughing and, you know, with our best mates, just, you know, going around the countryside or going all, all around England and Scotland, I think Ireland, all those sort of things where we, on all our tours. So it was some amazing, amazing times, some funny times. And, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those ones that you, you, you remember forever, even though they might be a bit patchy in the areas. These were, yeah, definitely a um, experience that I'll, I'll never forget. And, and I know a lot of those boys still value those moments. Well, you've kind of already touched on the 2003 season. Um, for you personally, it was another very good year. You scored 17 tries, including three doubles and your first hat-trick in the final game of the season. What I, what I would really like to ask you about in terms of 2003 was that first finals game against the Bulldogs. Um, everyone will remember it as the match where Francis Melly scored five tries. Um, personally, I consider that to be the best that the Warriors have ever played. Like that is the quintessential Warriors game. Um, you yourself and obviously Francis Melly and Sione Famoina on that edge were on fire. Um, that night, you were just untouchable. Had spiders all over you. Um, do you. Do you consider that the greatest edge that you've played on? Yeah, look, um, uh, look. Whether that was, you know, we had guys like Ali Lautiri and Sione, uh, Sione Famuina, who were, you know, and 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 the commentators' eyes were like the Harlem Globetrotters or Michael Jordan. Um, they were just carrying, it was like they were carrying around a tennis ball in their hands and that's how their grip was. And it was bamboozling because, you know, you're used to the stock standard footy of carrying it in two hands and, you know, playing before the line or through the line. And we were just juggling it around the place like, uh, like are these guys serious? But we were just like we would do at any family's backyard back in New Zealand or, you know, if you're a Kiwi, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. You're, 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 it's like you're playing in the backyard. And that's the the beauty of what Daniel was able to nurture, was nurturing the skill that was already there rather than trying to put a lid on it or trying to minimise it. He was just, he, he allowed us to sharpen and give ourselves confidence to, give ourselves options as opposed to it's only going one way. Yeah, <laughs> These boys yeah. keep holding it like that. It's not coming back, you know? Yeah. So it allowed us to, well, I can put it out there. Okay, it's not on there. I'll look to the other side. There's an option there. And it allowed us to add more strings to our bow, so to speak. And um, that's what made us hard to sort of combat or pre predict what we were able to do because we went in your stock standard um traditional player we were, we were more of that sort of ad lib people think we were playing off the cuff and ad libbing it but we actually trained like that yeah you know we had games specifically to play like that it's 
yes, we were playing like that when we were growing up in the backyard with our family and friends and, and, and on big outings or when we go and watch games at Carlton Park. Um, but Daniel allowed us to do that at training. You know, he was a big believer in don't wait till game day to do it. If you're not doing it at training, you're not allowed to have to do it on, on, on game day. <laughs> so, you know, you had to build a foundation in order to, you know, reap rewards from it. And that's what we were doing at training. Like even when we had left side versus right side, we almost came so competitive that we would always look to want to challenge each other after trainings and, you know, during trainings, you know, it would get heated. But that was that competitive um, mongrel we had in us at the time that, you know, chucking the, the, the sharpened skills of ad lib footy, then confidence and we were winning. It, it was a as it was a powerful kind of yeah nucleus that we had as a club and and you know I was just grateful to be a part of one of those bits and pieces of the puzzle that allowed us to you know sort of you know showcase that. Um, I was always running off the back of people. I wasn't creating it myself. I was always running off the back of guys like Logan, Arwen, Ali, Monty, all those guys. Um, you know, those guys had that ability to do that. And I just, they just put me in a hole and I'd try and finish it or put Franny away or Franny will do it all on his own. You know, I think we had a pretty <laughs> cool, He definitely did that uh, night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well to, well, to cap off 2003, you were selected again for the Kiwis um, in a one-off end-of-season test, and you absolutely terrorised the Kangaroos with a three-try haul in a rare win over the Aussies yes. in front of the parochial North Harbour <laughs> Stadium crowd. What do you remember about that game? Yeah, I don't know. I, as a youngster, man, I... And... I uh, probably said this before. When I first came into the Kiwis, um, it I, I don't it wasn't what I was anticipating, you know, like that. Like Australia almost had this aura about them that they were fucking unbeatable, you know. And I was just I hated that, and I I I didn't like losing, and I was kind of probably a bit too cocky. But I, um, I just had this mentality that I was going to do everything in my powers. You know, whether it was the first and only time on my debut that I got to play and wear that jersey, that I was going to battle for it and, and get some pride um, in, in our jersey and, and, and amongst our, our, our team. And I think um, over those next couple of years leading up to 2003 we were slowly building on bringing that pride back in the jersey because you know there was so much emphasis on state of origin that the international started dying out and yeah. you know, there weren't really much people having any pride in us because we could never beat Australia and um, uh, honestly ah, I don't think you realise how competitive I was um, and, and a lot of those boys were in terms of whether it's losing or, um, you know, being sink it, second rank to the Australians. I um, I loved our club and our country that much that I, I would try and do anything to try and beat it. So that day I was just, I was just trying to win. <laughs> and I know everybody else was. And I just, as the old cliche says, I just happened to put myself in the right positions at the right times and I was hungry for it. And I'm glad that, you know, Daniel Anderson allowed me to be wherever I got to be because normally a centre will stay on one side, you know, but I was going up in the middle, I was going on the other, I was, I was going all over the place and I think that sort of allowed me to be, a, a, you know, a bit of a bit of free spirit and then capitalise on those opportunities when they came about. So, yeah, yeah, those tries were scored and left, right, and centre here and there. And I think it was just that that momentum we had built over the years pre that um, allowed us to finally believe that they are beatable, you know, and mm. to do it in that fashion and to get a couple of tries in the mix was, yeah, always a um, a, a pleasing memory. 
It's a pleasing memory for all of us, bro. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> that um, yeah. following on from that, we go into the 2004 season, and 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 not to be too brutal, but it's probably one of the worst ever in the club's history. We only win six games that season, finish 14th. What was so different after the success of the previous three seasons that saw our form slump so dramatically? Look, I, I don't know how real or true this is, but when I when I when I look back and think back on it and I hear stories about it, Penrith Panthers and I think it was Parramatta Eels try to go size. Yep. So they you know, they, I think they did less running and just bulked everybody up, and it and it failed. And the it was supposedly Daniel. I don't know. Look, I could be wrong, but it was apparently the the we were trying to show that we could do it. So we tried to put on weight, and by the time we got to our first game, you we were bloody overweight and we were unfit and we were. So we did less of the stuff we did the years prior uh, because we were we were going to try and show that we, we, we as a club could do what they couldn't. You know, I think they tried going for size. Yeah. Uh, I, think they, I think they spoke about that in that 25-year documentary. Um, yes, I still haven't seen that, believe it or not. Oh, um, really? Oh, you must watch it. One Got of it. my mates, one of my mates keeps sending me... Um, the message of, oh, he should have just shut his mouth or something. <laughs> he keeps sending me that one where I got sent off. <laughs> okay, why, didn't you, why didn't you just shut your mouth or something? Oh, just having a bit of a laugh. But like I said, I was a bit of a loose cannon back then. And I, I, I hated, I hated, and please don't give me a job, but I hated the, um, the, 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 what do you call it, refereeing and the, the cause. It was, it was so demoralizing when you're playing to be in a game and then feel like they were taken away on cause that was so inconsistent. And I've just seen it year in, year out. And it still um, happens now. Still. Yeah. And, you know, and, and many people probably know this already, but. Um, Steve Price, before he came over to us, he, he said, oh, fuck. I used to think you guys were fucking whingers and carried on and this and that. Then he comes in and plays with us and he he's nearly having fights with refs and <laughs> the teams because he sort of soon realises the disparities of, you know, the officiating that we, you know, experienced and he, he got to experience. It was, it was so bad. He just wondered why, like, yeah, we're all competing, you know, for this this game we all love. Yet we can get undone by inconsistent calls, and you know, like when you're at home, the the rule is apparently meant to be the fifty fifty call goes to the home team. I don't know how many we've got over the years of those fifty fifty calls. Like a ball bounces and logs a little bit forward, and you regather and you might score a try. You know, the call is meant to go go to the the home team, but I, I don't know how many we actually got over the years. But, you know. Ten. We've got 10 in 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worst one, that, the worst one, I know I'm going to go off a bit, but the worst one that got me was when the Warriors played and the opposing team never got one penalty. And I don't know if I've ever seen that in all the history of rugby league. That was against, that was the, against Titans the Gold Coast last Titans. Year. Yeah, last yeah. year. Yeah. Last year. They, yeah. they were apparently played on. the perfect game. Like, yep. Is that the first time ever any club has done that in the history of rugby league? I don't, Not, I don't know. Is it? Like, it's, it's, un, yeah, it, it's it unheard is. of. It is. And it's like yeah. the other week where the Warriors completed 41 of 41 sets against the Dragons and then they they can't have the Warriors having 100% completion rate. So they, they said that we had one incomplete set and they counted the incomplete set was when the Dragons went for a short dropout. And the, and the Dragons regathered it, they made that as an error for the Warriors. We didn't even touch the ball. That became, yeah, we didn't. Touch, <laughs> they, that, that was our incomplete set. We didn't wow. even touch the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Did and, they take it away? Yeah. Yeah. And then. So um, 40 or 41. I'll have, say, I'll have to say, with all the sin bins for high shots on the weekend at Magic Round, with 17 players sin binned or sent off, Mitchell Moses hits Roger Square across the head. 
it's the only high shot all weekend that there's no sin bin for. So yeah, yeah and and that's the thing. Like I, I get they're trying to clamp down on it, but it, it's so inconsistent that it's yep. sort of it, it's yeah, it's affecting the game. I suppose it's when the first um, calls came in that I don't know first year or two when we're trying to rule out the shoulder charge. Like yeah. yes, sometimes I see shoulder charges and they're not even called like because yeah. they're in amongst three or four people off a kickoff he'll get the shoulder in <laughs> and then he falls down they've wrapped them up that's that should be classified as a shoulder charge but you know i'm not a referee i don't get trained to do that so i should just stay in my lane and just zip it <laughs> the funny thing is as worry supporters we can remember the every like it's not like just a random odd oh, you know we got pork we actually remember every poor call that yeah. goes against us it's um yeah, it, it happens so often. Well, <laughs> what what maybe we or the club needs to do is try and put a series of the you know so they can visually see what they're doing wrong because you know that those sometimes become the difference in winning or losing matches yeah. or turning turning a game. You know, absolutely. And Someone it, did make a Facebook post about it, didn't they? Of all the times yeah. that the that the referee boss had to apologise to the club on the Monday because they got all these calls wrong on the weekend. It's like, it's fish and chip paper, isn't it, on Monday morning? I mean, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd, like, because that team gets yeah. the two points or, you know, yeah. and, it, and it, it's like, and, and you can't you can't say anything. No. You know, like, you, you can't call it out for what it is because you'll get fined. <laughs> There's, um, I know we're off topic. But <laughs> <especially> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Career, but... But I, I go back to 2018 where um, two points separate first, who was um, yeah. Melbourne, and we finished eighth. Uh, two points fit, separates the whole top eight, but there was two games that the Warriors lost, one to South and one to Cronulla, where uh, I think it was South scored off a forward pass that wasn't called back. Cronulla scored uh, off a forward pass to win the match right at the end. And yeah. the other one was uh, Bully scores under the post and they call it back for being inside the 10 and then South go up the other end of the field and yeah. and score off a, a knock-on or something. So two contentious calls that you get, we get four more competition points and all of a sudden we've gone from eighth to minor premiers that, that season. Mm. So, Far out. I know. We remember everything, bro. Everything. everything. That's... Um... That's amazing. That's it's it's crazy and it's sad at the same time, eh? Yeah. You mentioned pricey before. Well, in two thousand and five, the club embarked on an aggressive recruitment drive, and we signed Steve Price and also Ruben Wiki, um, amongst others, to come and play for the club. So tell us what it was like playing week in without with those two legends of the game. Yeah, look, those guys were. Um, I suppose I'll uh, at my point in my career, I sort of. I sort of rested on my, um, you know, on, on my name that I'd established and, and I didn't really put enough emphasis on all the things that got me to where I got to enough and it sort of showed on the field. But getting back to those two legends, they were they were almost, um, you know, the perfect mix or match of, of, of different types of leaders. Um, Steve being very vocal and, uh, you know, he was, you know, driven by his work ethic and things like that to back up his actions where Ruben was one of those guys that just showed you all action. You know, he wasn't, he was really soft-spoken and um, he, he went about his business. He was um, just, a, just a real humble and pure leader that... Yeah. I think, um, I don't know if those boys ever really um, realised how much influence they had on all, uh, us all. Um, maybe me, I was still probably pretty all over the place, but I um, regret that I I didn't embrace the, the real and true leaders that I did have in those two players because they were quite unique in, in different aspects of how they carried themselves and how they led and you know, one was led by actions, and the other one was led by actions and words, and it was, you know, that's quite a distinct difference. You know, um, that's a big difference between what those two brought to it. We already knew what Ruben could do. Yep. Um, you know, we had probably glimpses over the years of what um, Steve was like, but 
he was really well spoken and knew how to hold a room and was um you know could bring the different um i guess types of leaders or conversations to any situation whether that's in corporate whether that's with you know supporters and the players that he had um, a knack of being quite um well spoken and respected in that manner and obviously rubes like you could hardly hear him but you 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 you, you might have could do um, on the field, but off the field as well, like doing things that, you know, sometimes you you take for granted that you got amazing people doing it in behind the scenes, whether that's taking our bags or cleaning up the sheds. Ruben had been doing that all, all his footy career. And, um, you know, that that that's true humility and humbleness to, to be a captain of a club that was so big in the Warriors. To, to do things like that. People say, oh, that all blacks do. Ruben was doing that. He'd been doing that forever. <laughs> you know, we always got compared as, oh, that they, they're copying this or they're doing that or they were doing that before. Like, Ruben's been doing that forever. He was just one of those kind of guys that, um, yeah, was just a, an amazing human. Yeah, it's no no coincidence that he's been honoured in the NRL Hall of Fame, hey. Um, and you, you've probably got, uh, you're probably one of the only few people who have had anything to do with the three Kiwis that have nominated in the Hall of Fame because you got to play with both Ruben and Stacey, and you were coached by Mark Graham, who you know was the first one inducted for us. Uh, yeah, yeah, those, um, oh, yeah, that was pretty, pretty unique and special moments for those boys. That'll be the, you know, one of the greatest milestones, but I know full well. That um, you know, Stace and 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 Rubes and obviously uh, Mark Graham will be, you know, they didn't play for those kinds of things. They didn't play for the accolades. They 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 played because they loved the game and they were bloody amazing at it. Um, that's just a cherry on top or a bonus, but mm. they truly deserved every accolade and honour that they got uh, in being, you know inducted into the Hall of Fame, Rugby League Hall of Fame. Yeah, well, mate, mate, I was a massive Bears fan before the Warriors came in the comp. And uh, when Mark Graham signed at the Bears back in 1982, I was uh, just going into high school. So, um, True. I wasn't a Bears fan, but I had a jersey, believe it or not. <laughs> My very first NRO or Rugby League jersey was a, was a, was a Bears one. Yes. That's the red and black, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a red with the, the funny black square quite... Yeah. Yep. And the um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we, yeah, brought that. Maybe. By the time I got through to, to the, the lower grades, mate, he'd, he'd left, which was sad. But Olsen was was still there. So Oh yes, another legend. Yep. Um yeah, although that, that two thousand and five season isn't a success on the field for our Warriors, um, you are part of that Kiwi squad that wins the Tri Nations, um, beating the kangaroos and keeping them scoreless in that memorable game. Uh, you spoke about, you know, how good it was beating him back in 03. How did it f uh, feel to finish that season on a high and, like, you know, keep that great kangaroo squad to, to zero on the scoreboard? Yeah, look, um, yeah, look, um, Louis, um, he, I, I really valued that he got that opportunity, homegrown, was able to climb to the ranks because, you know, I think, Sometimes our people ain't given more opportunities like that in, in those particular roles. And I think um, it was great to see Bluey have all that success in the in the, the lower grades and the local lower grades to get given that opportunity. But what he brought to the, the Kiwis was um, he brought in a psychologist and he, and he brought a whole heap of um, uh, valuable things that sort of added to the campaign. And um, I just, I think, well, we all bought into it. And I think there was something, uh, for me, I was trying to find myself again. I was trying to reinvigorate my career. I thought I'd <laughs> that gone a few steps backwards. And, and I think I got a bit of confidence off the back of, um, you know, that tour and that campaign. And, you know, to have the likes of Lockyer and all those guys, I think, 
might have been um, Andrew Johns, uh, you know, mm. the eighth immortal. Yep. Mm. All in those squads or those Aussie teams to to put it on them, like we did. Um, you know that 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 comes down to not just a team, but a big part of that was um, a massive part of that was um, Bluey, you know, and what he was able to to instill and get the boys, you know, humming along. To I don't think we've ever put a, a, a team like Australia to nil in, in all my time. I think ever. I think. No. So that was an amazing feat, and that's when the young Manu Vatuve was coming through. Yep. Yeah, we had a pretty cool vibe there too. We had an amazing vibe, and um, good, good, cool group there. Yeah, well, the 2006 season. Uh, unfortunately, becomes your last at the Warriors, and you announced in May that you've signed with the Leeds Rhinos for the 2007 season. So you, we granted an early release, and you leave the Warriors mid-season. So you played three seasons at Leeds. So how did you find your time in England? Yeah, look, I, I loved it. Like I said, I was still coming off the back of trying to reinvigorate myself off that 2005 campaign, and um, you know, in 2006. Obviously, didn't see eye to eye with Ivan at the time, and it sort of, sort of went pear shaped from there. And I was still trying to find what what I'd you know potentially lost. It. You know, I thought I'd lost it, but it was just confidence I'd lost, and um, that sense of arrogance or sort of that competitiveness wasn't wasn't gone, was gone. I think I'd mm-hmm. when I had my first child in two thousand and five, I. I didn't, it wasn't, I, there was a period where I wasn't even going to go back and play league, you know, because it was so weird. Like, um, I felt like I'd, you know, played at the highest level. I, you know, got, I, it wasn't like I was financially free or anything. It was just that my priorities had changed to league wasn't my be or an end or anymore. And I sort of fell out of love with that and in love with my, my newborn baby and, didn't care less about it. But I didn't, like I said, when we were pioneering a lot of our stuff, we didn't know that you had this opportunity to build a career and you don't stop once you get there. Because I had ticked off a lot of my goals or bucket lists, as they say, as a professional rugby league player. I was playing regular footy. I was getting decent money. I played for the Kiwis. We'd beaten the Australians. And I didn't know at the time because I was so young and I was, you know, pioneering a lot of that stuff for myself on a personal level that, you know, you got to go again or you, there's, you, you, you've got to set your sights higher and then you go for those and you just keep chipping away. Like, I didn't know that process. I didn't know that sort of model yep. uh, was the way to build, like, a legacy or build a, um, I guess, consistent footy. I was just happy to go. Yep, yeah, I done all of this. I'm not going to go back. I'm done. I don't know. I don't think I love it anymore. But you know, I managed to, you know, have some good people around me and Peter Brown, my mum, and um, George Mann. They were mentoring me at the time. And just sort of said, "Look, take this opportunity." And because I didn't feel the love at the Warriors, I sort of felt like I was wanted, you know, and. Um, I think that's a big thing for any person and player that you felt like you were wanted and you sort of belonged and yep. Leeds made me feel all of that and my family really it took to England, we loved it, we enjoyed it but I was still pretty young in the brain and mind and mature, maturity wise when I got over there they just um, it really looked after me, I playing with Ali, and then Webby joins the team, and um, Kylie Luluai, and we become a family within a family. Like, I, it's weird, because I knew Ali and Webby back at the Warriors, but I didn't get to actually fully know them until we were in England. I didn't really get to know them because they became our family now, and we're hanging out, the wives are still in, we're like barbecue, and things like that. But um, Bluey joined the, the ranks over there, and it just made everything so, um, I guess, enjoyable again. And over there, we were, you know, the little guys in sport over there. And so we were able to play 
our ad lib footy again and sort of get some confidence off the back of that. And you found we found that love again. Yeah. And that's what I enjoyed about it. But they were so um you know, so passionate over there. They were just on another level. <laughs> did you did you find there was much difference in the, the speed of the game and the defensive structures uh between like the Super League and the NRL at that time? Oh uh, look in, in the top three or four teams, yeah, it was no different. Um, but then, you know, in the lower teams, they were still competitive. I think it was more physical over there, but less structure. And I, I think the game has changed a bit over there now. But even just like when we first got there uh, in the first year or so, Webby, myself and Kylie and Ali, we'd, we'd, we'd do extras and um, we'd be doing extra stuff on top of our conditioning um, and would get the, the the head strength and conditioning guy come up to us and go, boys, boys, what are you doing? You make it, you're making me look bad. Is what is my stuff not hard enough? And we're like, oh, bro, we're we're just doing extras, you know. That's what we do, you know. We're doing extras just to put in. Oh, I guess, oh, boys, you're making me look bad. So, you know, to think that that's where I guess the and I don't want to disregard all those legends out there, but I think that was the mentality. What you got, that was enough. Yep. That makes sense? Yep. And for us to go that extra mile was a difference in sort of us trying to be better than what we were getting. If it, yeah, without sounding like it. Eh? <laughs> Sorry. I, um, I think, um, yeah. It, um, then I sort of fell back into enjoying that. <laughs> that's all I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leeds released you in 2008 due to a knee reconstruction that sidelined you for nine months. So there's interest from Japanese rugby and also Manly Sea Eagles. However, you find yourself back in NZ playing rugby. So how did that happen? Yeah, look, um, and this is the other thing that I loved about the Leeds Rhinos is that I had... 2008 and nine to go. I sort of had 2009 to go, but I was on decent money there at the time. And the the, the CEO, Gary Hetherington at the time, one of the best operators I've ever come across, he comes to me and he says, um, Toots, like we really value you. We want you to be a part of this club, but we, um, you know, we've got a couple of options here. We we, we want to keep you, we want to return you, but we know you're not going to be here or playing for the rest of 2008, but we need to free up some money. And um, we want to put you on a contract to sign you for 2009 and 2010. Because we know that, you know, you're going to be out for the rest of 2008 and you might start coming right because you get some confidence back mid-2000. Like, this is how much he's thinking of my welfare and looking for the future of the club, mm. that he had gone ahead. Any other club, boom, see you later, here's your severance pay, go. Yep. But he was, um, he, he valued me and he appreciated me and wanted our family to stick around. And so he said, I know you won't come right till sort of mid-2009 um, and we know we'll get the best footy coming into 2010, so we want to re-sign you, but, you know, just for less money and, you know, what do you think about that option? And he didn't even have to offer me that. Um, but like I said, I was still young in the brain, and I was like, he goes, oh, you can take the severance pay. And I was like, if that, I'm, yeah, let's go, let's go, you know. We're out here. Let's take the pay. I think it was 2.8 at the time, the 2.8 and the conversion. Anyway, um, I didn't come back with much, but nonetheless, uh, my my manager goes, oh, we, we there's some, uh, I'll check to see what rugby union opportunities there might be for you. And so I just started rehabbing. And, um, yeah, the, I was just all about money about that stage of my career. I was 28, 29. And um, basically to Shiva, and I don't know whether my manager was talking it up or not, but he said it's between six and 700 grand a year if you want to get on there. So... Toshiba flies over to Fakatane and um, watches me play. And I, I haven't played rugby union 
I'll probably play it once or twice in all my years with my brother who used to tell me to F off and they could play your own game. Um, but um, yeah, I, I get on the field and I'm just coming back from my rehab and, you know, they brought a, they, that translator and the coach up and he goes, look, you play one NPC game and we'll sign you. And so I, I'm like, it, I'm like, okay, who do I get need to get to? And I was, we were living in Fakatani at the time, so we were like, oh, let's see, they have plenty, let's see what they got. Man. They basically took a gamble. They probably knew what I'd done with league, but knew that I probably never played rugby union before. So they put me on the wing to start, and then I was just slowly coming back and working my way against the confidence. And then um, they put, they picked their final squad, and I'm in and amongst the, you know, some guys that. With some really great men and great players that could have gone on to be All Blacks, but um, no, Tony Do Latimer did actually play for the All Blacks, but and I was around those kind of guys, and it was such a great vibe, and they were good, good, good men, and it was a beautiful place to go and train uh, down at Mount Monganoo. Anyway, um, I'm running out on my first trial, and it was against Taranaki, and um, I've run to go back to get a kick, kick return. And as I've turned and run back, I felt oh. something go in my knee. Oh. And I was like, what the hell? And I had to come off and realize that I, I needed a, um, an operation to get a clean out. I tore menis my meniscus in that. Yep. And so Arwen rings me up because I was gutted. Arwen rings me up and he goes, oh, Toots, I know how much this means to you. If it's any consolation, I came back in a week, so it is possible. So I was just trying to rush to get back so I could sign this contract and Bob's your uncle. Um, but I try to push it. I was probably not as mentally as tough as Owen, maybe, but my knee flares up like you wouldn't believe. It was excess fluid that they've never seen. Like the doctors couldn't believe how much excess fluid I got in my knee. And I was walking around with this like, had a, like a cankle all the way up to my bloody knee. And was so fat. So I set out for the next sort of six, seven weeks of that 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 season. Yep. And it's and I just and I'm like trying to bust my ass, get back on the paddock and try and get that fluid out. It eventually slowly comes right, but I'm still a little bit busted. And um, I go and play um, just a warm-up game against Northland, and then they said, Oh, look, we're gonna get you over to play for one or two against one or two. So I've got friends and family come to support me in the stands, and I'm thinking, yeah, six, seven hundred grand. Come on, let's go. I've got this. And so um, I'm on the bench, and they go, "Toops, you're up." So start warming up. And so I get on the sidelines, and I start warming up, and I'm going up and down, but trying to be explosive. And then boom, in the warm up, I did freaking something in my left knee. Uh. Yeah, and turns out I can't. You know, cartilage and, and and meniscus in my my left knee, which was my good knee, and I was trying to strap it up. You know, I was like, "No, nah, f this, I'm gonna I'm gonna strap it up and I'm gonna be right." But it was the first time like that money didn't mean anything at the time. Like, if I was selfish, I could have probably went out there and made a fool of myself, or just gone out there and just showed that I could play NBC and sign the six, seven hundred thousand dollar contract at the age of freaking twenty nine. But I was I was kinda of embarrassed too, because you know, I had friends and family in the stands that I thought I had to go over and say <laughs> I injured myself in the bloody my and injured my chocolate knees in the bloody warm up. And yeah, oh. so that that didn't pan out, you know? And I was sort of gutted that I never really got to kick off a if it was something, I probably should have done it a lot earlier. But anyway, it's not all doom and gloom, though, mate, because you eventually find your way back to the NRL via a trial with the Gold Coast Titans. That yeah, was a one-year deal, then upgraded to two. You played twenty-seven games for the Titans, which included a semi-final win over the Warriors in twenty ten. <laughs> <laughs> How did it feel coming up against your old club and uh, and scoring a try and getting the win? Yeah, look. Uh, uh... It was bittersweet because I still held Warriors close to my heart. Like I, I told this um, in one of my last um, talks I've had that 
this was the strangest feeling I'd ever had in all my footy career. But our game against the Warriors, um, I'm warming up in the sheds and all my heart and mind is focused on is running out for the Warriors. And I'm fucking, I'm geared up in Titans gears. Yeah. And, I, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, there was this, you know, that, that, I don't know, it was a spiritual connection that um, that devotion I'd had to the Warriors for so long was still burning, you know? And I was in the sheds and I'm I'm there with the boys and all I'm thinking about is, oh, I'm running out for the Warriors. <laughs> And, I'm, and it's like 2010. It was the weirdest thing, the most craziest of thoughts that you could have. You know, you'd think I'd be like, I'll show you these buggers. Yeah. But I was like, no, nah, I want to run out with them. <laughs> anyway, I had to switch on and get my head around it. And I don't know, I think the Warriors beat us that day, but you know, it was nice to get that, that, that win to eventually take us to the heights that that club had never been to before. Yeah, that's right. Part of that journey was pretty special too. Yeah, you'd been out of the NRL for nearly four seasons. Had the game changed much when you did return in 2010? Uh, look, um, it didn't feel like it. It was probably more that my body had changed, but my mind was not. Like it was sort of weird how that was going on. When I left with my new knee, I literally thought that my knee was new and. I'm going to get an extra 20 years out of it, you know, just so that's how naive I bloody was. But it was the uh, beginning of the end, obviously, just slowed me down. And I, they kept me in centres over here at the um, the Titans. And I um, I never felt comfortable out there. I, I just want, I wanted to go back into the forwards and. Um, back to the back row where it started. Yeah. <laughs> And Cardi City was going to put me there eventually. Well, when I would come in and out, I was going back to Burley Bears at the time. But even oh, yeah. still, they they would always put me in centres. And I just felt like I'd lost that sort of dash and bit of speed off the mark to get around my opponent. Or, and I felt like I could be more useful in the middle where I actually like contact and yep. I could try and get some good, strong carries in the, man, the, monks, in the middle there. But never eventuated. And... You know, at the end of 2010, I was, you know, I was going to give up footy and I was still thinking about trying to get back to the Warriors, believe it or not. Mm. I reached out to see if I could come back. But, yeah, they uh, they wanted to keep a couple of other players on, which is, which is fair enough. But I, I didn't want to come back for money. It was about coming back to try and help yeah. give back and, mm. you know, nurture like the likes of Conrad and all those boys that were coming through. I would have loved to have tried to mentor him I was just in that frame of mind at, at that time you know being 30 I really wanted to come back and try and give back and like I said I didn't even, money didn't even matter to me I was just wanting to come back I just had this desire to come back and give back and help help with those young fellas because I I loved the way they played and I just yeah yeah didn't pan out but I you know, started setting up a life after footy, you know, once I took on the opportunities that came after 2010. You retired at the end of 2011. How emotional was your last game? Do you remember it? Oh, uh, look, I, I think, I think I, um, I didn't even know if it was the last time, you know, I, I think there was still an opportunity and one I sort of think, oh, what if, what if, you know, the people out there, they say, oh, they don't think about what, man, they bullshit, surely they're bullshitting. Like, you, you sort of contemplate it. But yeah. um, I had the opportunity to go with Trent Robinson and he sort of hit me up to say, would you like to come with me and to France and help mentor, um, you know, some of the boys over there. I think it was Seda Matasar um, yep. from from the Roosters, yep. he said, would, would you like to come over there and help me, you know, mentor these centres? I think you'll, you know, be good with some of these boys that are over there. And I seriously contemplated it, but my wife basically said, come on, <laughs> time to get on with the real world now. <laughs> yeah, enough's enough. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was like, I was thinking France, nice weather, you know, all right, money, 
And uh, that's when yeah, the Titans said, look, there's a job here, um, you know, be mentoring and facilitating programs and all these communities. Yep. It's there for you if you want it. And basically that's what won me over in the end. And I'm probably, you know, glad that I did because, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I wouldn't have experienced or transitioned as well as I probably would have have liked to have transitioned out of footy. Um, yep. And we weren't too sure if I would have loved to say, hey, can you hold that on the table? I'll just go away for a couple of years and then I'll come back and they offer me that role again. But yeah. I I was, yeah, I hadn't built a you know, strong enough relationship to ask that. I was just, just like, oh, you know, let's take it, it's there. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was the you know, best blessing because I finished with the guy named Preston Campbell that we all know and love and value and cherish. Um, he's the indigenous version of Ruben Wiki. Um, yeah. Mm. holds a lot of mana yeah you know a lot of integrity and just a great role model man and very humble all of all amazing things you can think of in a human being um that's in presto and obviously rubes but he he's he taught me a bit about you know being a better man in uh, i'm still a work in progress guys <laughs> all are, bro. Uh, <laughs> um I still get told off from my wife and I still get my kids correcting me and things like that. But um or calling me out when I'm you know, but you say this and I'm not like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well like you said, you're still involved in rugby league and you became an indigenous and Pacifica ambassador from twenty eleven. So in twenty sixteen you were named an Aral ambassador and in twenty eighteen you transitioned into the role of community program deliverer. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, um, oh, it, it, it was that opportunity after footy that sort of put me on that pathway because if I was being brutally honest, I was not looking in that direction whatsoever for whether that be a, an ambassador or a mentoring role. I, you know, I was always thinking I wanted to be my own boss and I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. I didn't know what, but I wanted to be my own boss and things like that. But allowing myself to sort of go in there, was able to sort of peel back some layers and sort of embed some really good things through um, my delivery with Preston Campbell out in these communities, mentoring young Indigenous kids. And, um, you know, I've, I've valued that transition. Um, and I think... Yeah, it's put me in a good stead to where I am today. So I'm working full-time with the NRL and we go around to communities across the country, grassroots rugby league clubs across the country. And we do things on domestic violence. We deliver a program on domestic violence. Uh, we deliver programs on uh, mental health. And what's great about it is that the program you know, we, we have a, a component where you're educating them on, you know, statistics and the realness and all these behaviours and things like that. But um, we have a, a field component where it allows them to get some messages through footy. And I think that's been a, a special piece to, um, you know, embed in these communities that we've gone into. So um, I really love that program, Boys Against Violence. Um, Alan Tung was one of the creators of the people that were behind the development of that program, as well as um, Steve Meredith. Um, but in 2013, um, you know, we had a couple of young boys take their lives to suicide. Yep. And um, that's where our program stemmed and sort of gained some momentum into the program that is today. And that was through Preston sharing his journey. Um, Black Dog Institute created this resource which allowed us to go out and deliver it and get the training required because I was too intimidated by suicide at the time. That stigma was still heavy in community. Because yep. I hadn't gone through it myself, I've probably done it for a lot of our supporters and coaches, you know, make them want to pull the hair out. Like, what the F is he doing? But I, I hadn't experienced it myself, touch wood. But... Um, I felt that I wasn't qualified enough and experienced to be able to go out and talk to these people who may have gone through it. 
and felt like I didn't want to fail them by not being able to resonate with them because I had an experience because they're like, well, what the F do you know? Yeah. But over time, it built my confidence up. And, you know, we have just come back from a community last night, actually, in Singleton. So I flew down to Sydney um, with Alan Tung and a couple of other colleagues. We drove to Singleton, which is about two or three hour drive from Sydney, and we delivered our grassroots program which is now going into uh, New South Wales. Uh, we've been to WA with the programs. We've been to Northern Territory, South Australia, w, um, obviously Queensland. And it's having a you know, really nice impact um, in our communities. And sometimes I feel really sad that I, I'm doing all this work over here, but I haven't had the opportunity to go back home and do it. Yeah. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed that you know, I can do that over sometime, but I know there's a lot of great people doing work like that already back home. So, um, you know, maybe a collaboration at some point, but oh, that's that's what I do now. I, um, a lot of the stuff in the background, it's not yep. because I idolise Darius Boyd, but um, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he's what, he was one of our ambassadors when he was playing. So yep. the idea is we go into grassroots clubs, we deliver this program, and it talks about the realness of mental health. And it allows people to um, become leaders, um, you, know, um, you know, increase their confidence and help seeking behaviours and um, creating this um, family collective to move the club forward in this space of mental health, yeah. um, whether that's, you know, conversations with as coaches, because a lot of time coaches talk about the game and this and that or who's the, the, the goose of the week, but never allow opportunities to get things off people's chest or allow people to you know, so we're trying to engage that through our coaches and conversations and whether that, hey, boys, just let you know, da da da, da we want to, yeah, sorry, man, I could keep going on forever, ever, but we'd, we'd engage our former players to be facilitators and our ambassadors or our current players to come out as well to help sort of impact the messages. And so, um, and it's not just a, you know, do your education and Bob's your uncle where you go. We, we've got a mental health action plan that the club goes through and sits through as well. And we put some actions to that and then we follow up and make sure that the club is doing, you know, as much as they can on top of their already hectic lives, but to move the club in a direction that is sustainable, that becomes, um, you know, if they leave tomorrow, it's going to be there in years to come. And so it's just little things like that to you know, encourage the importance of mental health, speaking up, checking in, being supportive, all those things. God and, bless uh, you. Yeah, love it. Yeah, God bless you because um, yeah, sometimes it's just about just reaching out and having that conversation. Um, mental health is something I'm extremely passionate about. It's affected my family, um, you know, over many, many years. So, and for so long, it was a conversation that was taboo that no yeah. one really wanted to have. So just reaching out and having conversations with people and, and bringing awareness to um, the whole mental health uh, stigma that's placed on it, uh, yeah. you know, taking it out of the darkness and bringing it into the light is um, Beautiful. really, yeah. really important. And, you you know, as, as someone who hasn't suffered mental health but is in that position what, that you're working in, um, you probably are so unaware of the amount of lives that you've actually impacted and touched and saved just from having the conversation so thank you very much for for what you're doing brother it's um it's awesome uh, like i truly believe it's um you know it's been a blessing for the game to you know you know jump out of the realms of what we're there for which is you know entertainment bringing yep. clubs together da, 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 to jump into a space that you know like you said even you know organizations bigger than the NRL were sort of too scared to sort of get in and talk about the conversations of mental health and yep. the effects it's had and for us to really embrace it and take it on and, you know, incorporate our game to deliver these messages is, um, it's, it's really, you know, um, a blessing for myself and former players that get to come back and, you know, join in these um, particular programs and, and deliver through our community and we are grateful we are we are grateful that the game is doing this for our communities doing this for our game 
we always get hammered. That's the thing that I hate. It's like no one wants to tell a story of you know the places our programs have gone and impacted, but they want to tell us about somebody who's effed up or who's you know made a mistake and obviously regretting it. I just, I just, it's almost like we're the target every year around the same times. You know, whether that's just before the season or end of the year. Yep. It's yeah. like they sit on stories and come after us, and I really, really does my head. In. I, yeah. I feel sorry for the game because um, I was at this conference, this mental health conference, where this head executive said, "We are leading the way in the space in, in all codes," but he wouldn't go out and say that in public, or people don't go out and tell us. We don't do it enough as, as a game to actually say, hey, we're, we're in the space. We could do 100 more, but we're leading the way, but nobody's going out there saying that, you know? And we don't even have to. <laughs> the game doesn't even have to do this. You know, sorry, I was a bit carried away here. <laughs> no, no, it's good that all. you're passionate about yeah, it, bro. Not at all, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you now reside on the Gold, Gold Coast. Are you a Warriors fan or a Titans fan? You know, there was a long period that I I was unbreakable, but because and look, I will always have a soft spot for the Warriors. Yep. But uh, I'm a bit maybe like Homer Simpson, where it's like um, you know wearing it on a split jersey, or you yeah. jump in the bush yeah. and come back out. But <laughs> um, I, I hope I don't disappoint anybody out there. But because the Titans have been so good to me, they were always the second club, <laughs> and. They would bend over backwards for just anything I would do, whether that's through work or just, you know, helping me or supporting me. And I felt like they, they, I owed them. And so they became my club. But I, I, I genuinely, you know, have the Warriors be closer to my heart and always has, you know, if I'm a common player that's gone out and wanting to run out for another team and you're, you're in the opposing team, that tells you how much that club means to me. Yep. And, um, yeah, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but there's 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 a there's a hope and a goal for me to try and get back there and coach that club one day. I was just going to ask you that. Interesting you should say that. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask. There was, there was a post that you made on social media that sort of went around the sort of Warriors circles a bit. Uh, exactly what you said. It was around the time that Steve Kearney got sacked last year. Um, talking about your ambitions to maybe coach the Warriors in 2025. Is is coaching yeah. in the NRL a goal for you? Yeah, 100%. I know it's probably yeah. a bit optimistic. People go, oh, that's, you're, you're dreaming, mate. That That's where my league career started with a dream and look what I was able to do. And I think um, that's definitely on my radar. They probably don't know it's on my radar, but it, it is on mine. You know, it might not happen in 2025, but I've come to learn that I love coaching <laughs> I um, I coached uh, for the very first time here on the Gold Coast they had a South Coast Maldives Rugby League and then they picked a Queensland Maldives Rugby League team out of there and I coached them and uh, this is back about 13 14 and then I went away from it they were seniors um, and then I was still playing you know the odd game locally here for Runaway Bay and then they handed me the reins in 2016 and I coached them. We came out of eighth, I think we came fifth. And then the following year, we went to the grand final and took that team to the grand final. First time in 10 years. So I was sort of proud of that particular moment. But I sort of went away. And then that was um, 217, 218. I didn't coach. I was trying to focus on doing it, get a bit more time for my kids because I was always coaching them away. And then <laughs> they didn't even want me to help them. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go back into coaching. So I got a call from 2019 from the guy who left Runaway Bay and opened that opportunity for me to go to head coach there, A grade, to go up there and coach the Mount Meninga, which was the under-18s. So I coached Mount Meninga under-18s up there for a year. They only played six games. Uh, we went through undefeated, and then we lost to get into the grand final, which Reese Welsh was playing for Tweed. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mount oh, Meninga. yeah. Well, it's crazy because Xavier Coates and all those boys were playing for Tweed. They came, they came fourth, we came first, and they limped in because they beat somebody like 70 to 
10 or something. So they got on points differential. So they, mm-hmm. if they had a, even got less than that, like a like 10 or so points less than that, they wouldn't have made the four. Wow. But they got into the four and then they played our boys and um, our boys were pretty, the, the year before they had Dave Fafita, they had Tanner Boyd, they had Tessie New, they had those boys the year before, but mm. they they were first graders now, so there was no chance I was getting them back. I thought maybe you might get Tessie New. <laughs> um, but um, no, nah, we, we had a good group of young boys that I think the best way to sum them up in that grand final was, oh, well, that's the prelim was we were deer in the headlights and that one still hurts me a bit because everything I put down on the tip sheet happened, you know, and yep. um, when they finally realised that they could compete, it was too late. But now I've got this opportunity to coach on the on, – I, I got taken up to assistant coach, the backs coach, before COVID hit in 2020, and then COVID hit, and then the coach left, and I tried to apply for that job there as head coach of South Logan where it all started for me. I'd come over there when I wouldn't make the Warriors and play yep. for South yeah. Logan anyway. Years later, I'm trying to have a crack at their Q Cup coach, but I, I didn't get it, um, obviously. And then an opportunity came up end of last year to coach this squad, which is their first time on the in, in A grade. So I'm coaching A grade here. And um, when I caught up with Daniel Anderson a couple of weeks ago with his Roosters Academy over at um, Logan there, he's like, what are you doing coaching these guys? You, you, know, you need to be coaching... Yeah, no, young men, you need to get back into the, the ISC system. Uh, yeah. They, they, they won't be coachable anymore. They, you know, they're, they're, they're past it. You need to get it back in the system. And I was like, oh. uh, I'm enjoying it there. It's a great club and it's probably the, the first club I've ever felt valued as a coach as opposed to the player, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, um, I felt like no one's given me the respect as a as a coach um, in my time that I've have coached pre this club that I'm at now. Um, and so they're the Helensvale Hornets here on A grade. We had eight teams. Now there's down to seven because one had to pull out, unfortunately, but um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, 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 I'm still enjoying it. And like I said, I was doing cutting up a bit of video yep. uh, before I jumped on with you guys. But um, yeah, I'm excited about these boys. We, Got a core group of young fellas that actually are there for the right reasons, as opposed to, you know, me. I wanted to establish the ones that had earned the right to get them there. But I wanted to give them the first opportunity. I didn't want to come in and bring in players in there. I, I, I wouldn't have liked that if it happened to me. So I didn't want to do that myself. So, you know, what came with that is having a mixed bag in my in my club. So. I better wrap it up there, but um, no, I'm excited and just love being around coaching. So um, I'd, I'd like to get on to an ISC club and then work my way up into the NRL to eventually come back home and Take do all the things. Yeah, 100%, man. And uh, you can't wait. I'd really love to embrace that opportunity. I said to Daniel Anderson, I said, if I ever get the uh, that job back there, would you come back and be my mentor? And he goes, fuck that. I'll come back and be your assistant coach. And I said, there's no way yeah. in the world that um, you're going to be my assistant coach. You'll be <laughs> like my, my, my mentor. You'll, it's, I'll, I'll be looking up to you. You know? You're not yeah. be, going to be my assistant. But, um, yeah. yeah, look, that's just a lot of talk, but it's, it's a vision. Yeah. It's a goal. And, um, you know, whether it happens in 2025, I'm, We'll just have to wait and see. Might have to get over there and start making some noise or letting those people know who are in the right places to say that, um, hey, put me in your radar. Cause... Absolutely. We, yeah. we certainly look forward to that. I'll talk well, to them on Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I've got, got to earn my straps here <laughs> first. But... Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read through the, the comments on the screen and, and Rob's going to ask you a couple of quick fire just, questions. Just before we yeah. let you go, we've got some rapid fire questions that Ooh. we ask all our guests. So okay. who, was, who was your toughest teammate? My toughest teammate would have to be, oh, yeah, Rubes, without a doubt. Um, yeah, just he's all heart and passion and just had a presence about him that, you know, 
I didn't come across you know too many of those. So yeah, we're in wiki. Okay, who was the most professional in regards to game preparation? Oh, there's. Can I name a couple? Yep, yeah, name a couple. Yeah, um, uh, Steve Steve Kearney. I knew you were going to um, say Steve Kearney. Yep. <laughs> um, Logan, Logan Swan, but one of the ultimate ultimate was a guy named Kevin Sinfield. Oh yeah. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mate, yeah. to the nth degree, oh, and maybe funny. over here on the Gold Coast was um. Uh, Mark Minicello or Ashley Harrison, okay. like, those yeah. guys were pretty, very professional, and um, you know, good men as well. Who was the best sledger you came across? Sledger, um, opposing or in the team? Either, either. either mate. Right? <laughs> oh, in the team was probably Natty Woods. I don't know if you remember Natty Woods. Yeah, I remember yeah. him. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he just he was just quick witted and, and feisty. But in terms of wit amongst the boys, Francis Melly, oh, believe wow, it or not, right. he's okay. yeah, he used to cut Ando down and anybody that used to oh, come right. at him. He was like the silent assassin. I would not expect that from him. Yeah. Yes, and um, oh, on the footy field, uh, you'd probably say because he got up my skin and got a penalty and I got hooked for it, but Terry, Terry Hill. Terry Hill. I didn't <laughs> want to say Terry Hill. Because <laughs> we ended up going to one of his bars and he, he was getting away with, like, cheap He was putting his hand in and the ref was letting him do it and I topped it one time. And we went to his bar over in, um, uh, in, our, in Sydney before that match, a couple of weeks before. And when I dropped it and got the penalty, he's going, Hey, how'd you like my fucking lobsters? Did you like the lobsters when you're there? He was doing it with his lift, but you know, and uh, yeah. I was oh, I wanted to punch his face in and I did think I'm getting the hook. Now get off, get off. Too many errors, penalties, you know, you're costing the team. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to punch his face in anyway. <laughs> Who was your toughest opponent? Uh look up uh, and I don't know if it's arrogance or whatever, but I I feared no one. Um in a sense of toughness, I feared players that had more strings to their bow, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. I'm talking like your Gidleys or your Gaznears or yep. your Kamanatahis, mm-hmm. those particular centres. Um, um, uh, McGuinness, I think it was McGuinness. Like they could step, mm-hmm. they could fend, they could chip, they could offload, they could skip in a way, they had speed like. That's what I feared. I'd never feared any contest of like that battle of Trish or whatever you want to call it. Mm. I'd never feared anybody in that sense. You know? Best trainer. Well, you know, for pound for pound for his body weight and everything else, and a guy that smoked, and kids, if you're listening, sorry, don't listen to this, that smoked curries and didn't mind a beer and everything else was a guy named Brent Wimp. I know we know it's not. I shouldn't even have said a guy named Brent Webb, but Brent Webb, he was one of he was like the strongest in our club, like in the gym, and he was the fittest in our in in, in our club, or one of the fittest. And the guy who had smoked cigarettes and <laughs> beers, and um, he he was a bit of a trendsetter too. So he was, um, as some would say, the package. But he, he used to always get shit because. Because he had a bit of a rig on him. Oh, yeah. He'd always take his shirt off, you know, and he'd be ripped up. It's like he swallowed a turtle and then go to ask to get his legs massaged, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, he, he was um, probably one of the first. Um, Wadingy was up there. Yep. Uh, Wattie Tony. But, um, yeah, those guys were machines. Just kept going and going. But. You know, Wadingy always had his physique because when we used to go out and have like schnitzels and stuff, he'd be in the corner, put a pattery in his bloody thing and a serviette to get all the oil off. You uh, know, people, <laughs> boys would give him shit, but that's why he's still got the rig he's got today. Yeah, I was right. going to say, have you seen how he looks now? I uh, know. He, he's still playing. <laughs> I saw that for another while. Tony yeah. Pado. Yeah, that's awesome to get the old legs back down there. 41, yeah. eh? Yeah, he, he's like Rubes, you know, probably oh, fitter, fitter now than they were. Now than he ever did when he was playing. He, he keeps getting younger with age. Yeah. Benji, Benji. Is that what they call him Benjamin Button. Benjamin, Benjamin Button, Button, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Team comedian. Oh, yeah. Um, 
that would have to be like Ali, Fekka. Uh, they just were always clowning around and having a bit of a laugh, but those guys were pretty pretty funny. And Francis Melly was pretty witty. Yeah. Oh, Francis Melly, eh? Yeah, yeah, I know. He had those one liners just boom out of nowhere. It's like he'd been saving them up and when Daniel gave him a shirt or something. I bet Brent Tate never found him funny, though. <laughs> Yo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah, neck breaker yeah. there. <laughs> oh, yeah. he get put on again. Yeah. yeah. Who was the worst trainer? Oh, uh, Peter Lewis. Peter Lewis. Oh, I remember, I remember Peter Pete, Lewis. His cent, centre, yeah. Well, the funniest thing was um, he he didn't train with us because he was injured, right? And so we go outside and we're absolutely flogged. By the time we come in, um, he's sitting on the bikes, right? And we're like sweating, dripping. It's hot as fuck out there. And we'll come in and he's drinking the water and he must have been bludgeoning in there. But as soon as he saw us, he looked at him and he started just <laughs> pouring it around us. Started pouring the water around us. <laughs> Honestly, it was the funniest thing. And there was only a couple of us. I think it was myself, Mark Tiki, and one other person that actually snapped him. And I just hammered him. But it was just so funny to see him look in and then go, oh, shit. <laughs> and then he started squirting his shirt to make him look like he was sweating. But anyway. I've got a couple of questions here, mate. Um, Charlie Ross has two questions for you. He oh, said man. he wants to know about your hairstyle choices and whether you had a VIP discount at the barber. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I've become a tight ass that I um, I used to get fades and stuff. We're not like I grew my hair after footy and I didn't cut it until there was this young girl that was in my daughter and uh, my wife's class who had grown a brain tumor. In a, oh, yeah. you know, and it was under her eye and I, I wanted to try and fundraise so I cut it then and then you know back home we'd get hooked up you know and then boys have got their businesses over here now so and brothers got to get out there and go pay 25 bucks 30 bucks for, mm-hmm. for a fade and I've got that kind of hair I wish it happened around on my beard here because I can't grow a beard to save myself like this has got about 30 years on it <laughs> and um Every time I go for a haircut, it costs me 20, 25 bucks. And sometimes they'll give me a $5 discount, but I'd have to get it every second week. That's how fast my hair grows because it starts getting that little. Anyway, I don't know. Too much mm. thinking. I used to get. Daniel started blaming me at one point. I focused too much on your bloody hair because um, Shantane, Huppy, and myself, and I think it might have been Henry, we were waxing Henry. our hair in the mirror yep. against St. George. Yeah. We're like, <laughs> You know, we were like, look good, feel good, play good, all good. But that day we got Total carved package. up. Yeah. yeah, we got carved up and he blamed me for having that hair day. But no, I don't get any hookups. That's why I've still got this bloody mop, mop on my head because I want to save my 20 bucks. <laughs> His second question was, who was the table tennis champion at your time at the club? Boom, boom. <laughs> I know I should be humble, but right here, baby, right here. If you want a challenge, man, bring them. Send them my way. You ask the boys, they know. It's on, It's on, Charlie. Yeah. I'll um, take you, Charlie. I'll take you, bro. We used to do it at um at, at, at Edgewater College where we used to go to just go at lunchtime and play. But um, down James Brown, bro, bring it. Um, did you have any pre-game game rituals or a game day routine before, like, before your games? Yeah, I, I always had, um, you know, the left foot in all the time, you know, that one random one left foot in my boot, left foot, yep. left soft, mm-hmm. left foot in my actual, like, putting it in my shorts. Yep. Um, I'd always get my lower back cracked before I, just before I go out on the field, mm-hmm. my spine, my neck cracked. And I used to have um, a Barocca BB bounce. I never had anything else. I just had Barocca and, and I dropped that in the parry, but those were my sort of. Uh, um. What's uh, your most memorable moment in your whole career? Just one moment. Oh, I flip. The, 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 the hat trick. Yeah. For the Kiwis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually beating them was, yeah. you know, for 50 years we'd never beaten Australia on Australian soil. And, well, yeah. Like to be a part of that, that's like mm. I wanted to be now that 
we're we're beating them. You know, I, I'd love for us to bring that back in the black and white jersey. That yep. you know, um, so. your your footy heroes growing up. I actually didn't have or follow anybody in rugby league. It was my local, um, my local team at the Mount Wellington Warriors. Yep. And um, I don't know. Um, it was um, you know, Butterbean, his his uncle. You know the oh the brown butterbean back home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dave Latelli. I played um, footy with him at Mount Wellington, but his uncle and um, his uncle that was his Lay Latelli. So he used to be a back rower, and my mum was like you know quite involved with the Mount Wellington Warriors. So we used to go up there and watch the seniors play every weekend, and I modelled my game off him because he was like the smallest guy on the field but he ran with the biggest heart and he's just, just never gave up and I always modelled everything I did off that guy and his name was to get Leila Telly um, and that's why I feel like you know there's still a place for A grade and yeah, you know absolutely. grassroots footy because I never looked up believe it or not we I get we a lot more exposure to NRL now and, but those were the players that I looked up to um, when I came through, you know, when you've got those juniors coming to your game and watching your 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 seniors, that's that's community, that's grassroots, that's what inspired me. What are your thoughts on the uh, six again rule? Oh, I like it. I really, really like it. It adds a different dimension to the game, but I just feel that it's inconsistent. There's, there'll be moments where you think, oh, that's six again, yeah. and then there'll be another moment where you're like, God, oh, that's not even six again. So it's so inconsistent um, that it's not having the like. It could end up helping one team just blow out, and yep. that's probably the only downfall of it. It's just those blowout scores because one team gets the advantage, but it's not consistent enough to have the, the the benefits that they're trying to get out of it. If that makes sense, I feel yeah, like. Nice. They, they really need to tighten it up. They need to have a, a second, like, it should be almost a count because yeah. sometimes you count and it's like 12 seconds and then they'll, yeah. they'll blow it for an eight-second hold, you know? Yeah. Somebody will get away with a 12-second hold and someone will get away with an eight-second or, or no, won't get away with the eight-second. It, it, it depends on the referee as well, doesn't it? Like, a, you know, one ref on the Friday night, uh, his interpretation is completely different to the mm. ref that, you know, comes out on a Saturday and ref. So. Yeah, that's that's the thing that I, I don't like about it. But it's bringing more fatigue into the game, which is allowing the guys who would probably normally not get to showcase their skills come into the forefront of entertaining footy. And I think that's what they're trying to get out of it. You know? If you had never become an NRL player, what career path do you think you would have followed in or gone in way back oh. as a young Clinton? Yeah, um, maybe a chippy, a chippy. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a painter, and I never liked that. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. yeah, yeah. What a boy! I'm a chippy by trade. So. Oh, true. Yeah, no, it just it just fascinated me, and um, even um, during my time as a footballer and post, my um, my uh, my wife's cousin's partner, he was a chippy. And owned his own business and I it just used to fascinate me the things that they do and build and create and yep. you know sometimes it might be the simplest thing to the most creative things I like um, I like that I'm quite a, I like creative things you know but who was who was the biggest influence on your career oh uh, yeah I, I, I'd, I'd like to think um, Peter Brown um, James Lillowine even a guy named Peter Brittenbeck, even though he may not know that, but he was the reasons why we, you know, he'd take me to trainings over to um, Oahu, but that was where it allowed me to, he recognised me and started pushing me in that direction. So, you know, those little people that have helped you up through your career, George Mann. Yep. Um, yeah, they, they, they were instrumental and obviously my coaches, so um, Daniel Anderson. But... Um, if the biggest influence out of them all, you know, and I don't even like doing that, but it was it would, it would have to be Peter Brown. Okay. Um, there's a lot of comments on on the feed, uh, just people saying how how much they loved you when you played. Um, 
Uh, you were the man. Uh, one of our good friends, Jay Harris, is involved with the Woi Woi Junior Rugby League Footy Club on the Central Coast. And he's said that um, they'd be dolly, delighted to have you guys come down and present your mental health program uh, oh, to them at one point. Uh, yeah. Where are they? They're in New they're, South Wales, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're actually on okay. the Central Coast. Wicked. Uh, so I, I can put you in touch with Jay. I'll send you Jay's details. And um, yeah, that would be, be cool. cool. That'd be yeah. awesome, will we? Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, appreciate the love and the appreciation that um, you know the supporters, the, the family. I should say, not even supporters. It's it's no, that Warriors family, you know. It's, oh, no, we're uh, it's um, mate, for us, it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you on uh, to chat with us. Um, yeah, it's uh, you've always been one of our favourites. Uh, and, and we just want to thank you for the amount of time you've given us tonight and um, how candid you've been with your responses and in, in answering our questions. I think I think we've actually just lost Clinton. He's I just, think we have he's too. Just sent me a message as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, look, we, we really do really appreciate his time. Warrior number yeah. 66, a, a legend of the club. And um, absolutely, we really appreciate you giving us all that time and... And as we said, we always fondly remembered. So, um, yeah, he's dropped out. He, yeah. he has dropped out, but yeah, well, obviously, we do thank him for his time. And, um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, mate, what a, what a great conversation. He, he, um, he really opened up. He, he spoke so well. I think it's the longest one we've done. It, it was. And again, it's, it's all the stories that, that we get out of it. Ace, I hope we might be back here. <laughs> oh, cool. We'll just we'll just say that. Um, hey, buddy. hey, hey, hey. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> Sorry, bro. I thought I'd just come back and just wrap up. Can you hear me, all right, boys? Yeah, no, we got you there. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying that. Um, we just we really want to thank you for your time. You know, you've given us over two hours tonight of your time. Uh, yeah. Sorry, boys. I know we talk underwater. Apologies. No, no, no. no, no, no we we've loved every minute yeah. of it. We love hearing the stories of all the players, especially yep. a legend like yourself. Um, Loved so, your honesty, your, you know, how candid you were in, in your responses. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been absolutely great. Everyone's been looking forward to this, this chat and you, you haven't let us down, mate. It's, um, it's been absolutely awesome. No, nah, nah, that's awesome, man. And, and, and good on you guys for, you know, keeping in touch with this kind of stuff and allowing people to have a voice and, yep. you know, your passion for, you know, our family. So I, I really appreciate you giving up your time, boys. Mate, I can't wait um, till um, the final round of the season when the Warriors take on the Titans. Uh, I'll be flying up definitely to, to watch that game. So hopefully um, we can get some seats together and, yep. and we can watch it. Yes, we get... yes, we'll definitely. We'll have, a, um, we'll have a beer or something together, yeah, boys. Bro, That'll we'll be get, awesome. We'll get Big Tooks to come along. And it will well. be... Yeah. Yeah, Big Tooks. And Rog, it'll be Roger's last uh, premiership game. Correct. Well, um, yeah. Hey, and just on that, I reckon RTS should stay fullback. Um, CHT into seven, and um, Young Welsh to six, and Cody nine. Yeah, yep. that's ev that's everyone. Everyone keeps saying the same uh, kind of scenario on the field, but um, you know, if you read the reports, you, Coach Nathan Brown has a massive rap on on Wade Egan and has spoken about how. He's the club's number nine moving forward, so I think... Well, why don't they just bring him off the bench? Uh, anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, I'm not a coach, remember? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not yet, not yet, anyway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Bro, well, thanks, thanks again, again, boys. Yeah, no dramas. Thanks, brother. Pre really thanks, so much and all the best. Soon. Much love. Thanks, thanks mate. Bro. We really appreciate it. Cheers. Go the Warriors. That's Go it. the Warriors. Go the Warriors. <laughs> and ruin him. <laughs> hey, Thanks, mate. <laughs> there is Warrior number 66. What a legend. Mm. What a great fella. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Again, how many good stories that we always get out of these out of these chats. And I, I know, mean, mate. We, could, we could talk Warriors all day, all night. It never gets old for us. <laughs>